today, let's study the Word of God under the subject, the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Today, 2,000 years ago, at this very hour, the apostles gathered in Mark's upper room and celebrated the sacred feast of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, the Holy Spirit came like a violent wind from heaven and rested on each of them. Through the fire of the Holy Spirit, like tongues of fire, everyone was given an earnest and ardent heart. From that time on, about 3,000 or 5,000 people came to God in a day. The day when this great work of preaching the gospel started in Samaria and to the ends of the earth was today the day of Pentecost. In the Old Testament, this day was called the Feast of Weeks, and in the New Testament, it is called the day of Pentecost. Let's open to Leviticus chapter 23 and take a look at the teaching about the Feast of Weeks. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15. From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. Which day was it? It was the Feast of First Fruits, or Resurrection Day. Isn't that why Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the day after the Sabbath as the first fruits of those who had fallen asleep? From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, count off seven full weeks. To calculate seven full weeks, we multiply 7 by 7 and get 49. Verse 16. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. When we look up the meaning of the word Pentecost, it means 50. So, the day of Pentecost was not a feast that originated in the New Testament times. Then from when was it kept? We can see it was a part of God's law that had been kept since the time of Moses, 3,500 years ago. In the New Testament, God fulfilled the prophecy of the day of Pentecost. The Old Testament is a shadow, and the New Testament is its reality. God's words in the Old Testament are mated with those in the New Testament, forming a relationship with each other in this way. Let's see verse 16. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. Verse 17. From wherever you live, bring two loaves made of two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour, baked with yeast as the offering of first fruits to the Lord. This day, the fiftieth day, from the day they brought the sheaf of the wave offering, that is, the fiftieth day from the resurrection day, is today. As for the dates of all the feasts of the Old Testament, God already appointed in the Law of Moses when they should be celebrated. According to the appointed time of the feasts, God poured out the Holy Spirit of the early reign upon all the saints of the early church on the 50th day, even in the New Testament. Then, why did God give the Holy Spirit on Pentecost? Let's find the reason and the will of God in granting the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So when they met together, they asked him, 
Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. It says, when the Holy Spirit comes, God's children who believe in God will receive power. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. For ten days, their earnest prayers to God, asking for the Holy Spirit and Mark's upper room, were fulfilled through the Holy Spirit of the early rain poured out on the day of Pentecost. And their life as witnesses who testified about Christ in Samaria and to the ends of the earth began from the day of Pentecost. When God's people began their life as witnesses, God granted them the amazing authority of the Holy Spirit and blessings, didn't He? Let us take a look at Acts chapter 2, verse 41, once again. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. According to his words, after receiving the power, the amazing power of the Holy Spirit, more powerful than before, was now together with the apostles and all of God's people. Verse 41. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And how many were added? About 3,000 were added to their number that day. Until then, only 120 people had gathered. But God added 3,000 in a day. God allowed the sudden growth of the church to begin through the Pentecost. It's not that simply 3,000 people were added in a day, but that preaching began from this time, didn't it? When Peter stood up and delivered the word of God, 3,000 people received grace and were so moved. Their eyes were opened and they were able to return to God through their repentance. Then, why did God grant us the Holy Spirit in this age? Didn't God give us abilities and power so that we can fulfill this type of work? Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 16. At the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. Ultimately, didn't God pour out the Holy Spirit so that we can give warning to the world, leading people to repentance? After witnessing how Jesus was crucified, dragged by the Roman soldiers, and arrested by the servants of the chief priests, the disciples were extremely afraid. Whenever they gathered, they met in secret and locked the door so no one else could come in. However, the disciples witnessed the power of Jesus' resurrection and 40 days later, the glory of Jesus' ascension to heaven. This greatly moved the hearts of the disciples. Immediately afterwards, according to the word, this kind can come out only by prayer. The disciples prayed for 10 days and the smoke of their incense, of their prayers, reached the throne of God in heaven. God poured out without any limitation, the ability and power to testify about Christ as witnesses in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Because they preached after receiving the power, the hearts of the people who listened to the word were wide open, and the amazing work of God's grace, where 3,000 or 5,000 people returned to God, began from this very day, the day of Pentecost. As we are preaching, not only to one billion people, but to 7.7 .7 billion people. Doesn't this feast, the day of Pentecost, have a truly important meaning? 
Among the words in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. Let us see how God warned them in verse 18. When I say to a wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways in order to save his life, that wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. We ought to understand very well the situation we are in and the ground we are standing on. Why did God pour out the Holy Spirit? Why did God allow us to keep these feasts? In the end, if we do not save them, God will hold us accountable for their blood. Verse 19. But if you do warn the wicked man, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his evil ways, he will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. God is awakening us to our mission by letting us understand that if someone does not receive, it is his fault, not the fault of those who preach to him. God taught us the mission that we must carry out as children of light and as the heavenly armies of light in order to lead the world to repentance and salvation. Let's open Psalms chapter 19 and find out how far this Word of God will reach if we fully carry out our mission as a watchman and witnesses of God. Psalms 19 verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to where? To the ends of the earth. It is written here that there is no place where God's word is not preached to and it will go out into all the earth to the ends of the world. While God's word is being preached to the ends of the earth, where should we tell those who listen to come? Come back to Zion. We should let them know about salvation saying, come to Zion where God dwells. Since God said that his word will surely go out to the ends of the earth. We cannot escape from the prophecy of the Bible, can we? Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 5. Announce in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say, Sound the trumpet throughout the land. Cry aloud and say, Gather together, let us flee to the fortified cities. Raise the signal to go to Zion. Flee for safety without delay. How should we go to Zion? We should not hesitate or delay, but flee to Zion without delay. It's because God dwells in Zion, reigns over Zion as our king, and forgives the sins of his children in Zion. God told us to gather in Zion, hoping that we would swiftly flee to Zion and receive the forgiveness of sins and salvation. Let's see Isaiah 33, verse 20. Look upon Zion, the city of our festivals. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a peaceful abode, a tent that will not be moved. Its stakes will never be pulled up, nor any of its ropes broken. There, the Lord will be our Mighty One. Where will God be with us? Surely, it is in Zion. So when we preach the gospel to all nations, we ought to say, let's walk the way of salvation together by returning to Zion, believing in God the Father and God the Mother who are in Zion and receive the forgiveness of sins. Let's see verse 21 again. There the Lord will be our Mighty One, 
It will be a place of broad rivers and streams. No galley with oars will ride them, no mighty ship will sail them. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. It is he who will do what? Who will save us. Let's continue with verse 23. Your rigging hangs loose. Your mast is not held secure. The sail is not spread. Then the abundance of spoils will be divided, and even the lame will carry off plunder. No one living in Zion will say, I am ill, and the sins of those who dwell there, in other words, those who dwell in Zion, will be forgiven. Because such grace and blessings of salvation can be found here, gather in Zion without delay. Whoever wants to receive salvation and the forgiveness of sins, come and meet God who dwells in Zion. Isn't this the way we should let them know and help them realize the truth? In the age of the Son, the disciples preached the gospel to all nations. Through the Holy Spirit of the early reign, poured out on the day of Pentecost, saying, Come to Jesus Christ, who is the Savior. In the same way, now in this last age of the Holy Spirit, we should preach wholeheartedly, saying, Come to the Spirit and the Bride, who are the Saviors in the age of the Holy Spirit. Come and receive the forgiveness of sins, salvation, and blessings of eternal life, and even meet God the Father and God the Mother. Shouldn't we shout aloud like this? According to the prophet Ezekiel, on whose behalf are we carrying out this work now? We are doing this work on behalf of God. Let's go to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22, verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. When the Spirit and the Bride, who are God the Father and God the Mother, spoke, what did they say to all mankind? They said, Come. When we preach to people in the world, relying on this word, Come, isn't it inviting them on behalf of Father and Mother? Shouldn't this news be preached to all 7.7 billion people of the world? When we preach the gospel like this, what do the prophets say about the result of our preaching? Let's see Jeremiah 3, verse 17. At that time, they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all nations will what? will gather in Jerusalem. When the Spirit and the Bride, that is, our heavenly Jerusalem Mother, say, Come, all nations will gather there. And all nations will gather in Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord. No longer will they follow the stubbornness of their evil hearts. In those days, the house of Judah will join the house of Israel, and together they will come from a northern land to the land I gave your forefathers as an inheritance. Through repentance, God's children who have returned to father and mother will never leave Jerusalem again, but march toward the eternal glory of the kingdom of heaven. Then won't God's work of the last gospel come to an end? God gave us the ability and the gifts so that we can have this hope and carry out the work of God through the Holy Spirit of the latter rain given on the day of Pentecost. Through the spiritual gifts that we have received, let us all preach in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let's see Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and His glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light. And what about the kings? Kings will come to the brightness of your dawn. God already formed all mankind and the systems of the earth in such a way so that they would all come as long as we shine the light. So let us stand firm with faith 
and preaching the gospel through the Holy Spirit we have received. Verse 8. Who are these that fly along like clouds, like doves to their nests? They all return, flying, carried on the arms. About 2,700 years ago, the prophet Isaiah described the scene of the last saints of heaven returning into the arms of Jerusalem, our Heavenly Mother. Let's skip to verse 20. Your sun will never set again, and your moon will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of sorrow will end. Then will all your people be righteous, and they'll possess the land forever. They are the shoot I planted for the work of my hands, for the display of my splendor. The least of you will become a thousand, the smallest of mighty nation. I am the Lord, in his time, I'll do this swiftly. As God granted the Holy Spirit of the early reign on Pentecost, and again, the Holy Spirit of the latter reign in this last age, we shouldn't rejoice at the mere fact that we've received it, but rather that there's something we must do. God pours down the Holy Spirit for a reason. God clothes us with power and gives us abilities so that we can work on behalf of God. To those who make effort, God always gives them ability to carry it out. So when doing the will of God, we should not rely on anything other than God. God said to those who work, He will surely grant them abilities. What good is a shovel or what good is a pickaxe if you're not working? All the tools are necessary for the workers who need them. Likewise, because the grace of the Holy Spirit and the ability of the Holy Spirit are necessary for those who do the work, as long as we do the work, God will grant them all to us. While preaching the gospel, sometimes we may face various difficulties or hesitate to preach due to our environment. However, there is no need to succumb to our environment at all. Whenever tribulation, suffering, or any kind of difficulties come upon us, there is something we need to consider. Everyone, let's say you have a cup full of water. If you put a handful of salt into the cup and all that salt dissolved, how would the water taste? It would taste very salty, wouldn't it? But let's not use a cup, but a different container this time. If you put the same amount of salt into a large lake and all the salt dissolved, how would the water from the lake taste? Can you taste the saltiness? No, you can't. Whenever we face difficulty while preaching the gospel, if we are narrow-minded, having little faith, a handful of salt feels extremely salty. However, if we have a broad mind, like the lake, no matter how much our external circumstances hinder us, they cannot affect us in any way. Because the apostles who received the Holy Spirit of the early reign preached with this mindset, even though the Pharisees and the teachers of the law slandered and hindered their preaching, even putting them in prison, no matter how much difficulty and pain came upon them, they didn't stop preaching. Whenever they gathered, they prayed earnestly and studied the Word diligently. And everyone devoted themselves to preaching the Word, putting into practice the teachings of Christ who said, Preach the gospel in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Though 3,000 and 5,000 were added to their number in a day, 
It wasn't because there weren't any difficulties or hardships. Living in this last age and preaching the gospel, let us believe that the Holy Spirit that God granted us on the day of Pentecost will certainly broaden our hearts for us to have greater faith. And even if there are hundreds and thousands of circumstances that try to hinder our preaching, according to His promise in Psalms 19, how far will the Word of God go out? It will go out to the ends of the earth. So through this sacred feast of Pentecost, we ought to make a firm resolution only to rely on God's promise and to preach the gospel in Samaria and to the ends of the earth, hoping that everyone receives abundant blessings of the Holy Spirit on this day of Pentecost. I would like to conclude the sermon. Thank you very much.